welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Duration. I'm the host of the show, Finding Our Future, and I'm here every other Wednesday, 1 to 1.30. And I like to interview people who have been involved with our community for a while and have some insights they can share and inspire the rest of our community. So Stuart Coleman is here, um, boss. <laughs> and, retiring. Yes, yeah, so a retiring boss and longtime activist. So can you introduce yourself for everyone? Yes, sure. Uh, thank you, Dore. My name is Stuart Coleman. And I have been the uh, regional manager for the Surfrider Foundation for the last 10 years. And I'm just about to embark on a new project. Yeah, so talk about your new project, yes. just to intro people to what that is. Yeah, so it's called by WAI. Um, it stands for Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations. Mm -hmm. And it's a new nonprofit that's dedicated to uh, water quality and specifically the kind of conversion and improvement of our cesspool situation. Yes, so we sometimes like laugh about how you're like the cesspool guy, the toilet yes. expert <laughs> and stuff. So can you share how you got involved? Like what made you passionate about this yeah. issue? Well, uh, probably five years ago, we started working a little more than that. We started working on the cesspool issues. And I learned that we, Hawaii has the highest number of cesspools in the country, which I was kind of stunned to learn. Um, we think of the pristine waters of Hawaii and the environment. Right. We have 88,000 cesspools across the state. Mm -hmm. And so I started working on the issue and with Surfrider and a number of different organizations, we were able to pass three different laws that first, uh, you know, ban the creation of new cesspools. Mm -hmm. And then the second law um, created a $10,000 tax credit for homeowners to con convert their cesspools into a more efficient system. Mm -hmm. Um, and then mandated the closure of all cesspools by 2050. And then the final law created the Cesspool Conversion Working Group, which I've been serving on. And then for people who don't know, can you explain what a cesspool is? Yes. And why, it, why they suck? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone just told me the other day, never trust a cesspool because they're full of crap. Um, so they're going to be a lot That's more. That's a meme. Yeah. <laughs> you make a meme out of that. Yeah. There are going to be a lot more of those coming, uh, a lot of those puns. But a cesspool is basically just a hole in the ground. So it's, the, it's literally the least, um, kind of the, the least developed form of uh, wastewater sanitation that exists in the world. You have a lot of them in developing countries. Um, but when Hawaii was being developed, so much of it was rural and it was country, and a, a lot of people just started digging cesspools. And so they're you know, anywhere from 20 to 40 feet deep, um, you know, three to five, six feet across, depending how big. And all the water from the house, including the gray water from the showers and sinks, and then the black water from the toilets goes into the cesspool, and then it just kind of permeates out through the soil. Some of them have bricks, um, but it, it leaches out into the environment. Right. Yeah. So I was surprised that neighborhoods like Black Point, which is known as like an extremely wealthy neighborhood, they still have cesspools. So what do they like look or smell or feel like? Like how yeah. come they're not known? Yeah. It's, um, it's remarkable that in Honolulu, you know, in, in one of the wealthy areas, we still have, you know, these cesspools, um, which kind of explains why the water quality sometimes in that area is bad, right. um, because it's porous rock and it's just filtering through. A lot of times you can't see this. It's in the yard, so everything's underground. And so there's, like, grass above it? Like, so there's what grass it above it. Or they're usually, um, sorry, there's usually, like, a, a hole um, like a manhole kind of size thing, and that's where you can go to pump it. You have to right. pump it every so often when it gets full. Most people don't even realize that. And so they don't pump it, and so when it rains, it just overflows, and that's part of the wow. problem. So maintenance of the cesspools is a big issue. And they have to pay for that, too, I'm guessing. Yeah. The homeowners have to pay for that. Yeah. But unlike people on the sewer system who pay, you know, average $100 a month, say, and they're not really part of the problem, people right. with cesspools are directly contributing to that, you know, knowingly or not, mm -hmm. and they don't have to pay any monthly fees. Right. And so we're, we're looking to create a program that's a little more equitable for everybody because the people who are contributing to the problem aren't doing any, you know, aren't giving any money to help clean it up. Right. And so maybe just having a very small fee mm -hmm. um, to help maintain and to help those who are poor Right. Um, upgrade their system. So just to be clear, though, the impact on the ocean, is that from, um, the, is it from water, rainwater coming in and overflowing it? Or is it more just like a runoff situation? Good question. It's both. 
So just when it works naturally, mm -hmm. it's going into the ground and it gets into the groundwater. Right. So at Black Point and places on the Big Island mm -hmm. and along the shores, the groundwater is very shallow. Right. And so if you have this thing going down, it's just seeping into the groundwater, yeah. which is going directly out into the ocean. Mm -hmm. If you're more upcountry and inland, it's still going into streams or groundwater and then coming out through submarine tubes. Yeah. Um, and so it's a problem just in the normal way it functions. And then also when it rains, they fill up and they overflow. Right. And then a lot of people just don't even know to, that they have to be pumped. Yeah. And so they're, they're not maintained regularly. And so we right. have an average of, pause for this, 50. Three million gallons per day of untreated wastewater is coming out through cesspools all across Hawaii. Every day? Every day. And, it, and is Oahu the worst just because we have the more, more people or is it more in rural areas? It's more in rural areas okay. because Oahu is the most sewered of all the counties, but there's still, you know, when you get outside of the city, mm -hmm. the North Shore, East Side, West Side, there's still lots and lots of cesspools. Yeah. But the Big Island has the most. They have um, almost half of the cesspools. All the, the off-grid hippies. Yes. <laughs> so what percentage of homeowners that have cesspools know that they have cesspools? Is it pretty much all of them or are some like just unaware? I think most people realize that yeah. they do, but there are probably some if they inherited a house from their parents, you know, or are renting, may have, may have no idea right. about how bad the problem is. Yeah. Okay, so um, just to finish up the cesspool conversation, yeah. I just think it's very interesting. Uh, the solution is that to... Um, go like door to door, homeowner by homeowner, and convince them to switch. And what are, what's the process for doing that right. for them? Yeah, so it, there's a there's a mandate that they have to all of them have to be converted by 2050. Yeah, that seems a long way off, right? Mm -hmm. But with 30 year mortgages mm -hmm. starting next year, if you buy a house and it's got a cesspool on it, and there's a 30 year mortgage that runs up against that conversion right. date. So by 2021, we have to have start having solutions so that we can help people with these conversions. And so one of the options we're trying to do is like a, um, a point of sale conversion. Yeah. So right now, if you do renovations to your house and you have to pull a permit, you have to upgrade your um, cesspool. Right. And if you buy a house and if you're in a certain area, like Priority One area, mm -hmm. like Kahalu on Oahu or upcountry Maui, then you have to immediately upgrade. Right. Um, so. You know, we see it in the water quality, especially in Kalu in the bays and, you know, on, on the Kaneohe side. Uh, in upcountry Maui, it's also a drinking water issue. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. it seeps into the groundwater. And so it seeps into the groundwater, oh, into the wells. And so, yeah, we're, you know, we, that's, it's a, the Department of Health who oversees this is really just trying to educate people about the nature of the problem right. and help them understand that, you know, nobody wants to contribute to the problem knowingly. Yeah. Most people just don't understand Right, so how would you, because you've been involved with so many ocean pollution issues for so long, how would you rank like the different polluter, pollutants that mm -hmm. enter the ocean? Like there's, you know, there's pesticides, there's cesspools, plastic. Yeah. Like if you had to rank like yeah. in terms of importance or volume, like whatever right. the measure would be. Yeah, that's a challenging question. The, the number one source of uh, water pollution is just stormwater runoff. Yeah. So whenever we have a storm, especially what's called that first rain, that first flush right. is what they call it. Mm -hmm. It's just all the streets, all the garbage, all the animal waste, the tire waste, the gasoline, oil, cigarette butts, plastic, everything goes out. Right. So you should never swim within, you know, at least 24 hours after a major rain, especially if it's the first major rain in a while. Right. Um, and so that's the number one. I'd say cesspools are probably number two, mm -hmm. you know, with 53 million gallons a day going into our surface waters in our ocean yeah. um, and you know pesticides and plastics are you know close three and four in terms of, you know the, hard to quantify with the volume but versus impact impact and, yeah. And, yeah but pesticides have a clear impact on our coral reefs and but now there are new studies from science are showing from science magazine are saying that um, plastics are abrasives and they scratch the coral and then they get infected so it Contributes to the disease and right. the coral bleaching of the coral reef. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And for some background on your involvement, because you've been with Surfrider for so long, can you yeah. share 
just kind of like a quick reflection on your experience, like maybe a quick like intro on how you got involved and where, yeah. like why you're moving on and kind of how you feel about that because it's yeah. been such a long yeah. place for you to live in our community. Yeah, I, so I was a, a teacher at private schools, Yolani and Punahou, and then at UH, and then finally at the East West Center, and loved teaching, but was also thinking I was teaching leadership at the East West Center, and I was like, okay, I want to get leadership out of the classroom and into the community. Yeah. And so there was an opportunity with Surfrider, and we created this the first position, the Oahu manager position, I mean, the Hawaii manager position for Surfrider. And so that was just a dream job. I was so happy. Uh, and so for 10 years, I was doing that. But it's, all, you know, it's five different chapters across Hawaii. It's five different initiatives and programs and campaigns. And water quality just arose as, for me, one of the most important issues that we have to deal with. And so it became, for me, more important and more of a personal issue because you hear of, there's more stories of people getting sick right. that we have, you know, four times the level of staff in the entire country, yeah. twice the level of MRSA, MRSA infections. So I was realizing, like, our water quality is down, you know, it's deteriorating quickly. And so I really wanted to focus on that. And I thought, this is one of the most important issues that no one has really been dealing with. Yeah. yeah. Chip Fletcher just told me that there's been an increased rate of mm -hmm. those infections and he was saying it's because of like the heat of the ocean mm -hmm. and how that just like uh, breeds bacteria. Yeah. So is that true? Because I hadn't really, I don't really follow like thicknesses happening from like yeah. surfers or ocean, entering the ocean. Well, one of the things that we've been talking about with uh, DOH and, and other groups is we're one of the few states that doctors don't have to report these illnesses. Oh. And so we need a database to track who's getting sick, whether it's waterborne intestinal or it's in, you know, infections like MRSA or yeah. staph, just so we have a clear database. But when you mentioned CHIP, it made me think of um, the, also the effects of uh, climate change and sea level rise. Right. So a lot of these uh, cesspools and even septic systems are near the coast. And so as the groundwater, as the water table rises, mm -hmm. the sea level rise, those things are going to start flooding over. And so the, the cesspool problem is going to become even worse. Yeah. So that's something we really have to kind of prepare for. Get ahead of. Get ahead and of. not like react later when it's more expensive exactly. and like an emergency. Exactly. Yeah, we got to be proactive and, and kind of get a better handle on it. Right. Um, yeah. So what, um, what would be like your wish for people to know? Like most people aren't, you know, they're not going to like get involved on a very deep level with like yeah. cesspools and water quality. So what would be like, your wish list or your message to like a general person who right. just wants to like be of help yeah. in terms of ocean and water quality. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm, uh, it's going to be fascinating because I volunteered for Surfrider for eight years before working there for the last 10. And I'm kind of going to be returning to that and volunteering and advising um, the chapters. And it's going to be a focus on water quality. And so I would tell people, get involved with Surfrider Foundation or Sierra Club, but these water quality issues are not going away, and these environmental issues are only going to get worse. And so we really have to start being, like you said, proactive so that they don't catch us by surprise and end up costing 10 times as much. Whereas if we plan for it, you know, we can, we can help ameliorate the situation before it gets too extreme. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, any other reflections from just like your time at Surfrider and yeah. like sharing the mission and any of before the work that you did? Before we do a deeper dive into Before we go on break. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Before yeah. we just talk about toilets. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think the, the biggest plug I would make for people is if you haven't volunteered, volunteering with Surfrider and working with them was transformational in my life. And I think people do this kind of a pit environment and business, and it's just such a false dichotomy because. Totally. We are totally pro-business, and we just want business to be smarter and be thinking towards the future and not longing towards the past. Um, and so get involved because it's, there are some of the greatest people you meet. They're passionate. They're diverse. They're business people, scientists, researchers, surf, you know, just people who love the ocean and love the environment. So whatever organization is, just get involved. Exactly. I love yeah. it. And Surfrider, I think, is like such, such a great organization because yeah. it is Pretty much, we're the only two staff yeah. for the whole state, and so it is volunteer run, and it's yeah. such a—I mean, people who volunteer are really dedicated and mm -hmm. they care about something. So it's 
a great community, Surfrider, and any other organization that resonates for you, all nonprofits need help. Yeah. Um, and it makes you happier. There are yeah. studies that show volunteering makes you happier, oh, totally. more community connected, you make friends, and you feel purposeful. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, this has truly become my ohana and extended family and friends out here. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're going to go on a quick break, and then after, when we come back, we'll talk about Bill 40 for a little bit, and, yeah, anything else related to oceans and water quality that we want to touch base on. Aloha. My name is Becky Sampson, and I'm the host of It's About Time. On the Think Tech Hawaii, a digital nonprofit organization that's raising public awareness. Join us on Wednesday at 2 p.m., where we talk about real issues. Some of the topics will include entrepreneurship, health, life skills, and growing your business. So once again, this is Becky Sampson on It's About Time on Wednesday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, welcome back to the show. This is Finding Our Future on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Duration. We're here every other Wednesday from 1 to 1.30. And I'm here today with Stuart Coleman, who's my boss at Surfrider, and he's outgoing. He's starting his own nonprofit. He'll be the executive director at VI, which is Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations, also the Hawaiian word for water. Okay. And I think it's really cool because VI VI means wealth. So water is life, and it's you know our most important resource. Um, not only for us as humans, but for our whole, like all wildlife and all living things. So um, I think it's such a, such a cool name for an organization and a really cool mission. So share a little bit about how that got started and like what the vision is for, yeah. for that nonprofit. Yeah, and just to, to build on what you said, to me, one of the most important things was um, realizing like the word wealth originally means well-being. And just how far we've gotten away with that, you know, totally. just like through consumerism and now that we you know, are approaching, you know, the Christmas season, you know, it's just all about things and the uh, Native Hawaiians and indigenous communities around the world have so much to teach us about like vi vi wealth, meaning water, like if you have water and then you can farm, you have everything you need right there. Mm -hmm. um, and so getting back to that original meaning of what true wealth is, that it's exactly. our well-being and straight very far from that. And so what I hope to do with this uh, new nonprofit is really kind of remind people how important clean water is. Um, because we're seeing across the country with Flint, Michigan, Michigan mm -hmm. with the lead in the pipes, and we have aging infrastructure systems around the country, um, sewer systems, and many cesspools and septic systems. And if we don't take care of these, they're the basic things, it's going to cost us so much more not only just in terms of you know, financial um, costs, but in terms of just health costs and, and well-being. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So how is the organization funded, and um, like, what is the actual work that you guys will be doing on the yeah. ground? So we, um, we're going to be focusing on kind of five areas, mm -hmm. and one of them is new technology. Um, I went to the Gates Foundation uh, last year, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And there's new technology that's just much cleaner and better than cesspools and septic system. So the financial piece and financial opportunities trying to, since we have this mandate, convert these cesspools, making sure that we find alternative funding for people. Because a lot of these cesspools are in poor communities, so we want to make sure that they're taken care of and they're not you know, given a burden that they have to buy a new system that they can't afford. Um, and then you know that entails community outreach, uh, and then there's policy and regulations that needs to change. You know, like updating the plumbing codes to separate gray and black water. Like that's a huge thing right there that will improve our water quality. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, and then just finally um, trying to set up a pilot project to where we can demonstrate some of these new technology and financial options to help the people of Hawaii with this burden. Because with 88,000 cesspools across the country, and a minimum of you know, at least 20,000 um, to convert them, you know, this is a multi-billion dollar problem. And so I just, we figured that they needed an organization that was really focused on this to help people with this transition. And so whether you have a cesspool or not, or a septic system, everybody's involved totally. because it's our water. Yeah, and yeah. I think just like learning about it as a citizen and a mm -hmm. community member is really important because I don't think most people are aware that this is an issue yeah. in Hawaii. And um, even if you hear it, like, I'm like, what is a cesspool, you know? Yeah. So just getting that message out there, it's just like plastic. Like plastic yeah. is now this global narrative. We all yeah. know about it. We know why it's a problem and we know what the solutions are. Yeah. So I think creating that around cesspools is really important. Yeah. So, I mean, I imagine, you know, you convert all the cesspools in Hawaii. Yeah. Maybe I'm optimistic and I'm just like, yeah, we can do that in the next 10, 20 years. Yeah. Who knows? But if you do that, then what would be next? For your organization, I think uh, you know it's going to take a while. You know, yeah, yeah, thirty yeah. years uh, at least to to do all this. But um, just the idea of clean water, you know, and reducing the amount of pollution. So, right. you know, there's green infrastructure projects. We're talking with uh, Pacific Current about um, you know doing uh, green infrastructure changes that reduces the amount of stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. um, so the more we can get into the ground. Uh, more permeable surfaces. Mm -hmm. So part of Surfrider, you know, we have our ocean-friendly gardens, and that key term is um, CPR, you know, right. conservation, permeability, um, and retention. So trying to keep the water in the land, recharging the aquifer, so we have plenty of drinking water, totally. and then out from taking all these chemicals, pesticides, pollutants into our waterways and to the ocean. Right. So that's a unfortunately a never-ending uh, job right there, but. We wanted to start with the cesspool problem, which was the biggest issue confronting us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you want to share about the Gates Foundation and the kind of origins of yeah. the organization? Yeah, so like I said, I kind of started working on this issue with Surfrider, passing a number of laws to deal with the cesspool issue. And then last year, I was invited to uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They had um, the Reinvented Toilet Expo, and I know you're jealous that you were not there. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> um, and every, uh, every poo pun you could make, uh, Representative Chris Lee made them. Um, and <laughs> Chris Lee and I were invited to be on the final, the closing panel of the conference, and there were like 500 people from around the world. And we were kind of confused. We're like, why are they asking us to speak? But it was really ingenious. The director, uh, Brian Arbogast, realized that if people from around the world and you know the Bill Gates Foundation focuses on uh, developing countries, mm -hmm. but if they realize that Hawaii, which is known as one of the most beautiful places on earth, mm -hmm. these pristine waters, has you know, a cesspool problem, then other people would be like, oh, we're not alone. This is truly a global issue that yeah. the developing world and the developed world are still dealing with. Right. And so we gave a talk about that, and then we kind of because they're working in the developing world, mm -hmm. um, we need Western companies right. um, to really adapt this new technology that um, the Bill Gates found, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation spent $200 million doing research for right. um, and coming up with a new te technology. And it's pretty funny, at his opening conference, and the world is watching, it's going to be headlines around the world, he puts a jar of human excrement on the podium. Ah! <laughs> and everybody's like, oh my God, that's gonna make headline, headlines right there. Yeah. And he said, you know, when I first began, we were looking at computers that, that were the size of an entire room. And we had this vision for personal computers and, you know, that, that could just change and radically change our society. And he's like, when we started the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we were looking at all the diseases, the most deadly diseases in the around, around the world, yeah. and they all came back to wastewater. Yeah. Unsanitary you know, processes and people getting sick and preventable diseases. Totally, yeah. And so he spent all this money and he was just like, look at the toilet. We've had the same toilet since Thomas Crapper you know, basically <laughs> invented yeah. um, the toilet or popularized it in England um, almost 150 years ago. Yeah. And so he's like, you know, we really realized this was the area that needed the greatest amount of innovation. Yeah, totally. Like, yeah. why do we, like, 
Also, maybe, maybe this is a little different, but like, why do we pee and poop into like potable drinking water? Yeah. Like, I feel like that's so unnecessary. Like, there's so much recycled gray water we can yeah. use, and like, drinking water is like scarce for a lot of impoverished countries, and it yeah. just feels like a slap in the face to absolutely. people who can't even access fresh drinking water. Absolutely. I mean, that when you think about it, with countries, and there were a lot of countries represented at this expo yeah. in Beijing that, you know, have like real water issues. And increasingly, like South Africa, yeah. there was a day where they ran out of water. So you know, It's so scary. Not just developing countries anymore. And, and, you know, like the idea of using clean drinking water is just ridiculous. Yeah, I'm wasting so it. It's, it's a total waste. And so yeah. that's one of the things that we hope to change. You know, it's a scale of small little changes we can make separating gray water and black water. Right. And you can recycle the water from your shower to flush your toilet or your sink. Yeah. You know, there's no reason that can't be a connection right there exactly. to fill it up and not use clean, potable drinking water. So, so easy. Just a little bit of technology. A little bit of technology anything. and we can do anything. Two, there's vast changes. Right. And the three basic categories are the, you know, the single-use toilet you have in a home uh -huh. um, that, you know, is totally self-sufficient. It's not connected to plumbing. Um, the new Gates technology, that's still a year or two out, mm -hmm. um, but they models, they're testing around the world. And then there's like the multi-use bathrooms that you might find in a park yeah. or a school or a playground, mm -hmm. you know, four to eight seats. Mm -hmm. And the, the great thing about these is that when you're going out in the country, part of the reason people have these cesspools is because there are no sewer lines. You know, on the east side, when right. you go into Kahalu, it's just too expensive. It's yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars. And so, you know, people go into the ground and build, a, build the cesspool. But what we can have here is you don't need a sewer system. It's completely off the grid, very low energy, can be powered by solar. And what it does is it separates the liquids and the solids mm -hmm. and then burns the solids, which becomes its own fuel and helps burn it. And then that pasteurizes the water. And so the water can be totally recycled for garden use, can be Crazy. used for anything. Um, yeah, so we need more circular systems. Like everything's linear, we just waste things. So exactly. it, the more we can see things as a resource, I think that's what we need. Exactly. One of the great you know, expenses that we have yeah. is pumping water all across the island mm -hmm. to get to these treatment plants. Right. We treat it, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on these plants, yeah. and then we just pump it out to sea. So it's, it's a one-way system, and it's total wasted water and, yeah. you know, everything. Where these systems, it's 100% circular, you recycle everything, and the burned waste becomes biochar. Mm -hmm. And you can literally put that in your garden. It is the best. It's pathogen-free, yeah. chemical-free, and it's a great fertilizer. Yeah, that's And awesome. it's also a carbon sink. Exactly. Sequestering yeah. carbon. People don't know that. Yes. A lot of people. Um, so we do have to wrap it up, but I do just want to do a quick shout out to Bill Forty yeah. and Civic Engagement. If you can do a little something, and then we got to close up the show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks to people like you and uh, you know all of the good folks at Sierra Club and Sustainable Coastlines and Zero Waste Oahu and uh, Kukua Hawaii Foundation and Beach and so many others. After I've been working on this issue for ten years, as you know, that's what I started on, and nobody really knew about plastic pollution. Mm -hmm. And just last week, we were able to pass Bill 40, which, you know, is going to be one of the leading examples of bills across the country to reduce plastic pollution. So it's super exciting. Yeah, yeah. And then so for people who want to get involved with Surfrider, you know, we just had this huge victory. It's a super good time to get involved. Or any of the other nonprofits we gave a shout out to. Um, just like follow us on Instagram or get on our email list or our websites. And um, we'll be kind of gearing up for the legislative session. So there will be mm -hmm. some stuff around cesspools, plastics. We'll see what kind of comes up. Um, but January through May is the legislative session, and 2020 is an election year. So we really highly encourage everyone to register to vote. It's going to be a vote by mail. You can vote in your underwear or your pajamas at <laughs> home. So just register to vote at your current address. Super easy. It takes a minute to do online. Um, and register as a Democrat if you want to vote in the presidential primary. Yeah. So that's like my little civic engagement. Um, yeah. Do you have any final words? You know, I just say that uh, watching Bill 40 pass over the last 10 years and that development, we've engaged so many people, thousands of people, and I just want to empower people. You can turn government around, and it's so exciting to be part of it. It's really fun, and I think that's what people don't understand. So get involved, and let's make Hawaii the best place it can be. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so mm -hmm. much. This is our show.